Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of 5 Minute History or Quick Chinese History or whatever the heck I call this series. Today I'm going to be talking about the Zhou Dynasty. And the Zhou Dynasty is probably it's the most important, complicated, confusing time in Chinese history. This is intended to be an overview so I am probably going to miss a lot of points but I'll try to cover the essentials, okay? Let's get started. The Zhou Dynasty lasted from about 1046 to 254. BC. That's a long time, you guys. <laughs> and it's basically split into two parts, the Western Zhou and the Eastern Zhou. The Zhou Dynasty is considered one of the most important, if not the most important, Chinese dynasty because of the emergence of a lot of foundational parts of Chinese culture, things like the Tao Te Ching, the Mandate of Heaven, uh, the Analects of Confucius, the emergence of legalism, the emergence of, of a lot of things that are considered fundamental to Chinese civilization. They all came about during this time, so it can't be overlooked in a study of China. Now the Zhou coexisted with and at times were a tributary state to the Shang and they're living in what is now known as Shanxi province and after they conquered the Shang they set up the new dynasty the Zhou dynasty under King Wu although some people credit it to his father Wen but you know well the dynasty started. Now the dynasty begins kind of rough because after only two or three years of ruling King Wu has to go and die. Hooray right? And then after he died there's a whole string of rebellions and revolts from from like all the different regional rulers and all the different tribes and things like that. It's chaos. And so a new king is brought into power. His name is King Cheng. But the thing is he's not very experienced. So there's a guy, there's a duke, the Duke of Zhou, who is trying to help him and does things like he comes up with the Mandate of Heaven for one. He comes up with the Feng Jian system which we'll talk about in a minute. And he also starts placating all these tribal leaders and, and like people of the, the Shang, giving them titles of nobility, giving them land, things like that to make them happy. And so the, the revolts and rebellions kind of die a little bit. Die down a little bit I mean. However, there is a problem. This territory that the Zhou Dynasty are ruling is a little bit too big. They have to decentralize it a little bit. They have to break it up a little bit. So they establish what is called the Feng Jian system. And the Feng Jian system is almost like European feudalism because the emperors offer the Feng, this land, to the uh, local lords and they establish basically what are vassal states called Jian. So we have the Feng Jian system. It starts out really clearly defined and it is a proper system we can easily keep track of but it doesn't always stay that way. Now under this system, male nobles were granted troops and domains based on their rank within society. And eventually the people, kind of everyone else, are split into what are called the four occupations. Now these occupations are eventually developed from Confucian and legalistic philosophers. So they're the ones who come up with the four occupations a little bit later. Now this all sounds well and good and very European and all that, but there's a key difference between European feudalism and Chinese feudalism, the Feng Jian system, and that is people who are born into a certain class in China, like if they were born to a, a, the Gong class, the craftsman class, they don't have to stay in that class forever. They can, you know, change to whatever class that they want, you know, based on uh, their desires or their aptitudes, things like that. So people aren't necessarily stuck into roles forever. So that is a key difference between European feudalism and Chinese feudalism. But there are more differences between the two. We can get into them, you know, on another day. But nothing lasts forever and the Feng Jian system is no exception. The local lords start competing with each other and there's, you know, all these rivalries and these rivalries really overpower the sense of loyalty to the Zhou itself. So in some of these houses actually were able to rival the power and prestige of the Zhou. Now things are already bad and then the 12th king of the dynasty, King Yeo, decides to make things even worse by deposing Queen Shen and the crown prince in favor of, you know, some other people. And so Shen's father, who's understandably pissed off, mounts an attack against King Yeo and Yeo gets killed, you know, boo-hoo, right? And the capital is moved eastward. It's moved from Haojing to Chengzhou and Haojing was in present-day Xi'an and Chengzhou is in what is now Luoyang. So, that's the beginning of the Eastern Zhou Dynasty. The Eastern Zhou really marked the decline of the dynasty. Everything descends into chaos. And the, after the capital is moved, they really lose a lot of their power and they become a figurehead of basically all the other states who are doing just basically whatever they want. And this period becomes known as the Spring and Autumn period, which will get its own episode, as well as the following period after that, which is the Warring States period, which is obviously not good even by the sound of the name, right? 
during this spring and autumn period, there are about 150 states that exist at this time. Most of them get absorbed into the four big ones, which are Qin, Jin, Qi, and Chu. And this is a really crazy time because they are all like annexing each other, they're declaring war against each other, they're in claims against each other, and the power is shifting from one person to the next all the time, from one moment to the next. And eventually all this fighting leads to what's known as the Partition of Jin and the Warring States period. Now the Warring States period, I think you can guess, is a period where we see a lot of war. All of these different states I just mentioned and a couple of others, they're fighting in this struggle for hegemony, and eventually you see the victory of the Qin state and the establishment of the Qin dynasty. So, hooray, fantastic. We have a united China after the end of that. However, it's not all bad news. With all this constant upheaval and this war and this fighting and all this stuff, it inspires this guy named Sun Tzu to write a little book you might have heard of called The Art of War. And he's not the only one. There's a guy named Confucius, you might know him. There's a guy named Lao Tzu, you might know him. There's a guy named Xiangyang, you might not know him. There's a guy named Mencius, who you may or may not know, but all of these people emerged in the same period of time, at the same period of time, and they laid the very foundation of what we know as Chinese philosophy and thought in really classical China. They lay the foundation for that all within this period. The Zhou Dynasty, the Spring and Autumn period, and the Warring States period not only continue to be a source of study for a lot of people, they also are a source of, of continuous creativity. I live in China, and in China, when you watch TV, you see a lot of these old historical dramas. They're set during the Zhou Dynasty, or they're set during the Spring and Autumn period. They're set during the Warring States period, because not only is it very interesting to study, but it does lay the foundation, the very foundation of this culture. And it cannot be overlooked if you say you want to study the history of China. Ah, oh, okay, so I finally rebooted this history series. I've made my video about the Zhou Dynasty. And, oh, thank God, it's about time too, right? So if you liked the video, go ahead and click like on it. And if you want to, leave a comment, and we can talk about this really interesting time in Chinese history. If I'm new to you, you're not familiar with me, I do make China videos every single week. So go ahead and click subscribe if you're interested in that kind of thing. And, um, guess that's about it. See you all.